here. Yep. Well, good evening. Great to see you all here. Make your way in. If you hear me on the outside, we are just about to get started. My name is Manny. I'm one of the pastors here, and I just want to take a moment to welcome you to this evening with Dr. J.P. Moreland. Put your hands together, please. Thank you. And if you're watching online, go ahead and give me a virtual clap. There it goes, there it goes. Hey, I am so excited for you to hear Dr. J.P. Moreland this evening. I came encountered with his, I became encountered with his writings about 20 years ago when I was cutting my teeth in ministry as a youth pastor here at Calvary Monterey. It was the first time that my pastor, Pastor Nate's dad, Pastor Bill, put one of his books in my hand. Love Your God With All Your Mind. It was such a pivotal book in my development. I was still a young pastor, a young ministry leader, and this book was just foundational in my development. The importance, one of the things it taught me was the importance of the mind in spiritual growth. I was challenged to begin to think biblically, to develop my intellect and my reason, and it, it taught me how to further God's kingdom with my mind through evangelism, apologetics, worship, and even my own profession. And so I'm so excited for you to hear his voice. This was my first time actually meeting him. Yeah. And so this evening, as you walked in over on your left-hand side, as you walk out, it'll be to your right. We have a book table with a couple of his books that will be for sale. They're $15 each. And when you entered, you should have been given a little card that has the phone number that you can begin texting in your questions. We will have a Q&A question, a Q&A question and answer period after uh, Dr. Moreland speaks where you can... Um, I'll be facilitating those, those questions for you, but if you can send them in via text, that would be awesome. The number is up there on the screen. At any time this evening, you can text in your question. In addition to that, you should have received one of these booklets. If you did not receive the booklet or the card, please go ahead and raise your hand, and someone will come down the aisle, uh, count, come down the aisle and hand one to you. Dr. Moreland is a distinguished professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology. He has four degrees in the areas of theology, science, and philosophy, and he has co-authored, authored or co-authored 30 books. In my opinion, and I think many Christians would agree, he is one of the leading minds, thinkers, and voices of our time. Do you please do me a favor, put your hands together and give a heartfelt Calvary Monterey welcome for Dr. Morning. Thank you. Thank you, Monterey. Thank you. Well, I, I want to start by thanking uh, Pastor Manny, Pastor Nate, and Pastor Matthew, who's uh, sick with the flu. Uh, I think he actually got a copy of the notes ahead of time, and it made him sick. So, uh, but, but, you know, God bless him. But, uh, and uh, Pastor Heather and others who invited me. I have to say that my wife of 45 years, Hope, is here and it's a joy to have her with me. Uh, and uh, she and I, over the last several years, have uh, come to, to love uh, Frank and, and Ray Darabont as, as family members. We've grown so close to them. And it was really Ray and Frank's initiative uh, to, to, do, to do this that got the idea before the pastoral staff, and they are... Uh, uh, taking care of us while we're here and overseeing our lodging and, and meals and so on. And so a real thanks to you, Ray. I know Frank is homesick. But I, they've told me so much about how much they love this church and, and, and the mind-boggling things that are happening here. And I am honored to, honored to be with you. And can I just say to you, please stay faithful and keep going. Don't turn back. Don't, don't let stuff get into your life that you're not willing to face. Deal with it. Because the, the stakes are really high, and we're in the midst of something that's happening in our culture that is no game. And uh, it's, it's, it's for the souls of men and women in this culture. And the only hope, in my opinion, is a revitalized, pure, faithful church that knows why it believes. And so we all have a long way to go, but let's commit ourselves together 
uh, to make progress. And I hope tonight we'll bump you a little further down the road. Now, let me tell you how we're going to do this. I'm going to speak uh, at the beginning here. It'll be more a lecture than a sermon. And so you have notes in the little booklet that you were given. And my, import, my concern here is to clarify and clear up some notions about shame and guilt, forgiveness, what it is and what it isn't. And so, so this can be a more positive thing in your life. Uh, and then after that, we're going to have an hour of question and answer. Uh, you can leave whenever you want, but uh, uh, this is, I, I hope that some of you who've come are atheists or agnostics or skeptics of some kind or, or maybe seekers. You don't believe this stuff, but um, you're interested in pursuing it, and maybe you've got a question that's holding you back. Well, I, I want to try to help with those. If you're a believer, maybe there's something that still bugs you about Christianity, and you'd, you'd like to be able to ask it. Now, I can't guarantee that I can give you an answer to all these, but I'm willing to give it a shot. And if I don't know something, I'll make it up. So, I mean, you know, that's the way it goes. That's how I became a distinguished professor. <laughs> or as one of my colleagues called it, an extinguished professor. But in any case... So, so that time is not about the lecture. It's about any question you want to raise and, and, and clarify. Now, let's open up your, uh, your notebooks or whatever you want to call them. You're going to be graded on this. And so you, you want to take notes because it will be on the test. Um, I want to talk about... Uh, getting rid of guilt and shameful feelings, and learning to forgive. Now, this is a very touchy, difficult subject to talk about, to be honest. Because all of us have people that have hurt the heck out of us. Right now, there's somebody, in, probably somebody that you know, that if you had a chance, you'd slip their throat, or at least throw them in a river, uh, or, or maybe something lesser, but if, if we knew what was really in your heart, uh, you're, you, you, you're battling with them all the time in your head. And as I call it, you're giving them free rent. Uh, and they're controlling you because uh, they're in your mind all the time. And guess what? You win all the arguments with them, don't you? Isn't that amazing? When you're ba uh, arguing against somebody that's hurt you and you're re reasoning, you I, at least I always win the ones that, that it's, it's funny, isn't it? But the problem is that you're actually being controlled by the person. And letting it go is hard, but it's essential if you want a vibrant Christian life. And learning how to do it is part of what we're going to talk about. So it's touchy to talk about this. You have done things to people that you can't forgive yourself. Uh, and you say, think, if, if other people knew about this, I'd really be embarrassed and ashamed. And so you, you beat up on yourself about it. And I think that all of this activity is the result of not understanding what forgiveness is, because there's a lot of confusion about it, uh, uh, even in the church. I mean, you see somebody on TV whose uh, son, or, or her daughter rather, it was raped or murdered, and they say, we have already forgiven th this person. And I say to myself, I don't, I don't think I could do that. I think I'd need time to do that. And I think that this is pretty quick. Not so sure this really, uh, there's really been a forgiveness here, but maybe the beginning of a process of forgiveness. But so, so we need to get clear on this subject, and that's what we're going to do. So here's where I'm going. I'll begin by talking about the blessings of forgiving and receiving forgiveness. By the way, when I say the word forgiveness from now on, I'm going to mean it to mean both giving forgiveness and receiving forgiveness, unless the context shows otherwise, because I don't want to keep repeating that. So uh, that's what forgiveness will mean, receiving it and giving it, either one. But, but So I'm going to talk about the benefits of that that accrue to us uh, it, it, with respect to a flourishing and growing life. After that, I want to talk a little bit about the role that shame, feelings of shame and guilt uh, should play in the Christian life and try to clarify what that role is. 
After that, I want to talk about what forgiveness is and what it's not, so we can be very, very clear about what it means to forgive someone else or to forgive yourself, which is a huge problem. After that, uh, I'm going to talk about how practically do you become a forgiving kind of person who is, has the tendency to forgive as their initial reaction to being harmed, rather than, in a postmodern culture, the, the, the highest virtue is a tendency to take offense. Uh, and so we're taught that we should be, uh, take offense at all kinds of things. That does nothing but divide people, and it causes a slow deterioration and deadening of the person's soul. And we want, to, we want live souls filled with joy and goodness. But that doesn't come uh, easily. You have to, with the Spirit's help, work on it. And one of the things you have to learn to do is how to practice things that will make me grow toward being a forgiving kind of person it, without thinking about it. That's the natural, habituated reaction that I will express and we want to learn how to grow that way. Next, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, sh uh, should, we should we judge other people? Uh, that's a controversial question that, that I think there's some confusion about, and then I'll close uh, uh, with um, just some miscellaneous things I want to add. If we have a little bit of time, maybe I'll tell you some fun things about me, uh, about my childhood, and about... I was a star in high school, football, basketball, and I'd love to talk about some of that stuff. So, so maybe, I'll, maybe I'll do a little bit of that if we have time. <laughs> Please don't leave during that time. It's very important, okay? Okay, yeah, let's, let's get going here. And uh, let's take a look at the benefits of giving and receiving forgiveness when it's properly understood. Spiritual benefits. You have peace with God and an increased experience of his love and kindness. It helps to remove your guilt and shame. And this is important. It gives you the power to seek God because when you feel unforgiven or you haven't forgiven somebody, it weakens your armor and it weakens your ability to have the motivation to seek God. And that's one of the reasons why we become lukewarm and lazy in our faith is because of a lack of being or, or giving forgiveness. And so forgiveness helps with that, and it gives people courage to stand for the kingdom. Can I, can I speak frank with you? We're, the evangelical community today is largely filled with cowards. I, I'm sorry, and I don't mean to be mean-spirited. Uh, and, I, you know, if it doesn't apply to you, that's great. But, but basically, we're, we're cowards. We're afraid to talk about what we believe. We're afraid to stand up and say, oh, we think that homosexuality is wrong or some other moral issue if it's relevant. And there you can do that in a loving way and this, that, and the other, but we are basically afraid. And I think that we need Christians who are courageous without being argumentative or defensive, who can be kind and gracious, but courageous and just stand. Stand. You can't be moved. And if, I st if I'm standing the day I die, I will have been grateful for the life I lived. I just want to be able to stand. And that's what's wrapped up in this whole issue about forgiveness. So uh, the relational benefits. Harmony in your marriage or friendship relations replaces anger. Contempt, which is the number one sign that you're headed toward divorce. Uh, and discord. Uh, relational benefit also is the removal of disruptive behavior of attack and withholding. These are the two methods that we try to control our spouses or close friends. We either aggressively attack them or we withdraw and we withhold affection or conversation. We don't talk to them. And those are the ways we basically try to retain a sense of control and safety for ourselves. We either get strong and attack the person, or we withdraw and withhold 
what is rightfully theirs, like being able to have a conversation with you or what have you. And those are, they're dangerous, but, but uh, for, when you forgive, it removes the tendency to do these forms of self-protection. Um, you achieve a reputation of being a safe, open, and accepting person. Boy, does that sound good. You know, people say, you know, you, that so-and-so is really safe. You can say anything you need to say to them, and they're and they're going to be, they're not going to spread it. They're they're open to hearing what what's bothering you, even if it's heretical or whatever it is, and they're they're accepting. That doesn't mean they'll agree with you what what you're doing, but they will love you in, in the process. And for learning to be a forgiving person, achieves that. Now moral benefits. It's usually the right thing to do. There's some there's exceptions, but they're rare where forgiving can be harmful. So we'll, we can talk about that later, but let's just say for the most part, it's the right thing to do. Uh, it avoids hypocrisy. Uh, when I do something wrong, I want others to forgive me. I mean, gosh, I want them to let me off the hook or forgive me. Uh, I don't want them to continue beating me up for something that I did. Well, if I want it, I mean, do you want people to forgive you? Well, okay, praise the Lord. Um, well, so do I. And uh, so if I want that, don't you think it would be consistent for me to try to give it to other people? It seems a little bit hypocritical for me to want it but not give it. And so by forgiving, I avoid that kind of hypocrisy. Um, physical benefits, oh my gosh. Uh, it lowers blood pressure. Uh, a chance, whatever, uh, chances of cancer and heart disease, agitated nervous system disorders, it strengthens your immune system and your general health. And I could go on, but there are all kinds of physical uh, benefit. It, it lowers your chances of getting cancer. And... and, and Incredible. Anyway, there are physical benefits. Finally, psychological benefits. It allows me to be kind and nurturing to myself. And, the, and we all need to learn how to nurture ourselves and, and be, be kind to ourselves. Little tip, if you want to learn how to, to be uh, gentle towards something, you need to learn to see it in two ways. This is a freebie I'm adding. Um, if you want to be gentle towards something, you need to be able to see it in two ways. Number one is precious, and number two is vulnerable. So we're, we take a little puppy, a little dog. We, we want to try to be gentle with the little thing because we see the little guy's precious. But we also see him or her as vulnerable, and that brings out affections of gentleness towards us. If you want to be gentle with yourself, instead of beating yourself up all the time, you have to learn to see yourself as a really, really precious person. And we'll talk about later, but God really likes to think about you. He likes you. He thinks about you and he likes it. So you're precious, but you're also vulnerable. Are we, are we all broken and vulnerable people? Is anybody in here who doesn't? See that? Sir, please, put your hand down. Uh, no. No, we all, we all know that we're broken, and, uh, and, and, and so we, be kind to yourself and learn how to nurture yourself, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, let me give you a, a, a reflection here um, in addition to the uh, uh, psychological benefits uh, Number, I want to read number seven. I know I'm jumping over a point. But if look, think about this. If Christianity is true for the sake of argument, let's assume for the sake of argument Christianity is true. If it's true, then, then one would predict, and this is kind of like scientific methodology, you would predict to make certain discoveries in psychology and in medicine. And those discoveries would be that the teachings of Christianity about wisdom and spiritual, physical, psychological practices and attitudes would be good for us, wouldn't you think? If Christianity was true, you would think that the teachings 
about li- how to live and, and so on that are in, this, in the scriptures would be good for us. Well, guess what they've discovered? They're all good for us. Scientists have find, they, they came out with this incredible discovery uh, uh, a few years back. Gratitude is really good for people, and it helps you get rid of depression and anxiety. And it's even more important than having hope in life, is learning to practice the art of giving gratitude. I wrote a book on uh, dealing with depression and anxiety, and I gave four solutions to that. One of them is learning how to practice gratitude. Well, duh, the Apostle Paul said that 2,000 years ago, and we've been waiting for these knuckleheads to catch up. So finally, scientists have discovered it. And the same thing about about serving other people instead of being self-focused. Forgiveness and a litany of things that psychologists are starting to say, oh my gosh, this is good for you. And the Bible said it a long time ago. And so we're just kind of waiting for, for people to discover what we already knew was true, doggone it. And so that gives evidence that Christianity is true. Do you understand? If you have a hypothesis that predicts certain things and you discover that they in fact obtain, that lends some confirmation to your hypothesis. And this gives evidence that the Christian religion is actually a true description of how we really function. Now, I'm starting to preach, and I'm going to quit, because my blood pressure is increasing. (laughs) So isn't that cool? So the benefits of forgiveness are over the charts, ladies and gentlemen. They're so, that makes this an important issue. This is not one of those, not, oh, it's such a nice little Christian idea. Let's, let's make a song out of it and, and sing about it. And it's just so sweet. Uh, now, Christianity is not sweet. It is countercultural and it's revolutionary. And this forgiveness business is right at the bottom of it. And so let's ask ourselves the question, what is the role that guilt and shame play in the Christian life? And I make a distinction between what I call false subjective guilt and shame and objective guilt and shame. What is that? Well, false subjective guilt and shame is having inappropriate guilt and shaming feelings and attitudes towards oneself. When you, don't, when you haven't done anything wrong, it's, it's when parental tapes play and you were told not good enough. You're just not good enough. Nothing you do, you can never get your dad to say, you did a great job. You, you know, he always says, you know, you could have done better on that. And so you grow up with the message, as a friend of mine told me, that he's not good enough. And so he's constantly feeling feelings of guilt and shame when, when he shouldn't, because he hasn't done anything wrong. On the other hand, Uh, objective guilt and shame is genuinely doing something wrong and shameful. One can have objective guilt and shame without subjective guilt and shame and the other way around, meaning that you can feel guilty and shameful when you really haven't done anything wrong. So your conscience is distorted by factors that have made you be hypersensitive to things. am Am I right about this or am I right? Okay, I, sit, that's, I give my students those same alternatives. And it turns out that I'm right. So that, don't you love that? That's, that's, I still have a salary. All right. Um, and, and, and you can actually do something that's, that's guilty, that is absolutely guilty, producing, and wrong, and shameful, but not feel it because you're out of touch with your feelings or you're unaware of, uh, of you know, that this bothered somebody, Okay. So what that means is that your feelings of guilt and shame are not always good indications as to whether you really have done something wrong. They're they're a real mixed bag. Now, the fundamental problem causing a lack of of self-forgiveness is being hard on oneself. It is life... It is being prideful. A prideful character puts one in a position of lacking the ability, look at this, to have pity on oneself. 
Now look at the top of the first page, please, where I quote Dallas Willard. Are you ready? People who are merciless and unable to pity others and receive pity simply have a hard life full of unresolvable problems. And the word pity is crucial because our, you don't find that word in our culture anymore. And that's a, that is a sign of the moral corruption of society that we have lost words like pity. And um, charity it, it used to be uh, taking pity on someone and giving them something to help. But where you were recognizing that they were in need. But now... That, you know, that's not, that, you're not supposed to do that. That's looking down on the poor. And it's not politically correct. Uh, you know, people don't say, when you say thank you, people don't say, uh, you're welcome. Instead, they say, hey, no problem. Well, heck, if it was no problem, why am I thanking you for it? I mean, give me a break. You don't thank people for something that wasn't a problem. When you thank somebody, they're in a position of, of having been a servant to you. Do you understand that? And so that lowers them below you in people's minds because they were the servant. And it's not good to be a servant. That's not Christianity's view. So instead of saying, you're welcome, they say, it's no problem. Nobody does that intentionally. These linguistic shifts creep into a culture slowly as moral attitudes change and words get reinterpreted to express new views, some of them get abandoned altogether. The word pity is to, is to, take, to take a merciful, pitiful understanding the sad state of another and consequently taking pity on them. And as a result, being, being prideful puts you in a gives you a prideful character which puts you in a position of not being able to have pity on yourself. Such pity is a prerequisite for forgiving. You can't pity someone, someone you can't forgive someone if you don't pity them. Now let me, let me give you what I mean by that. One of the ways that we learn to forgive people is that we recognize our common humanity with that person and how absolutely messed up we all are. That in our fallen human nature, we're just broken. And I'm sorry if you're an atheist here. I'm just, this is a conversation with Christians. Uh, you're, you're welcome to listen in. If you want to ask me about it later, you can do what you want if you do it courteously. But... This whole thing about um, a forgiveness re requires that we realize our own brokenness. Think about forgiving yourself for something you did. You have to start by saying, I'm messed up. I'm just, I'm fallen. I'm not, none of us is what God wants us to be. And neither are the other people that hurt me. And so, you know what? We're in a pitiful situation. And that's, by the way, why we need Jesus in the scriptures and fellowships like this. Because we're all messed up and we're pitiful. Now, we can grow, thank God. But the, I'm, I'm simply trying to say that we have to recognize the pitiful state we're all in. We're not anywhere close to what God wanted us to be. Now, that don't get guilty about that. <laughs> but that should move us to take pity on ourselves. And that means that we would, be, we would nurture ourselves because we're vulnerable and we're precious. Are you seeing the connection there? So to take pity is a, is a prerequisite for then extending forgiveness because you are aware of someone's complete fallenness and it may be bad circumstances. Now, um, there are two scriptures that are that are absolutely foundational to this whole enterprise. And if I could suggest this, either memorize these or put them on a three by five card and put them on the fridge or your dashboard next to your, you know, Jesus thing that 
the bobblehead Jesus, put, put, put this next to him on your dashboard. And uh, these verses are absolutely revolutionary if you come to actually believe them. And look, the first one says, Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. Now, you know about Colossians 2, 13 to 14. You're, you know that when people were crucified in those days, the, the, the crimes for which they were crucified was often put above their heads and nailed on their cross. And if people drove came by, and the crosses were actually about eye level. They weren't as high like we see them in the movies because it allowed people to have the ability to spit in your face if you were being crucified or to come along and get in your face and mock and, and derange you. And that's why you're, what you did wrong is right there above your head so people can know why Rome decided to, to take your life, and they, they can detest you and can jump on board. Do you, under, do you understand it? So the purpose of crucifixion was more than just taking the life of a person guilty of something, but it was to send a message about what happens to people that are shameful like this, okay? Well, in light of that, Paul says in Colossians, and when you were dead in your wrongdoings and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, that is, you did not have a new nature you, were, you had a fallen nature, and that's all you had. He made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our wrongdoings. Now, having canceled the certificate of death, of death that consisted of decrees against us, which was nailed on our cross above our heads, which were hostile to us, and he has taken that out of the way, having nailed it to Jesus' cross. Do you understand? Dennis, well, I love Dennis Prager, but Dennis Prager says, how in the world can a person uh, be like Adolf Hitler and live his whole life, and, and then, you know, on his deathbed, he, he cries out to Jesus and asks for forgiveness? How in the world can, how is that moral? He's getting, he's getting away with a life of unbelievable evil. Uh, well, what Dennis doesn't understand, I love Dennis Prager, but what he doesn't get is the incredible magnitude and gravitas of the crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth as the Son of God because all the things that Hitler or whoever makes a deathbed conversion, who means it, now that, that's obvious, those were the things they did did not go unpunished. They did not. They were nailed to the cross, and Jesus suffered them. So it's not like they got away with it. There was a substitute that paid for those things, all of them. And that's why it's not immoral for that to be true, because the presupposition that underlies the immorality claim of that, a deathbed conversion, assumes that in deathbed conversions, nothing was done about all the wrong they did. But there was something that was done about all the wrong they did, and it was, thank God, a substitute that was willing to experience and take on the things I did wrong and pay it for me. That's that, I just want to get clear on that because that's an objection often raised against the idea of substitutionary atonement of Jesus dying on the cross for other people. So now, these, these two verses have got to be in your mind. And I say, uh, uh, based on these verses, Jesus followers should no longer experience feelings of guilt and shame. Now, let me say that again. What role the feelings of guilt and shame play in the Christian life? Zero. They play no role at all. Anytime you're feeling guilt or shame about something, that you're, you're out of bounds, and you've got to retrain yourself to stop feeling that way. Now, I know you're looking at me and thinking, his great learning has driven him mad. <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you what you should feel. But the reason I say that you should not have those feelings is because of the two verses I just mentioned. 
They're either true, in which case I'm never to feel the weight of guilt and shame for myself because someone else did it for me, all right? Here is what I should feel instead. Instead, Christians should feel godly sorrow. Let me tell you the difference. Godly sorrow is a sense of sadness for what one has done or for one's lack of character growth in some area. You're sad that, doggone it, I just, I'm, still, I'm still not a really warm, kind person, at least like I should be at this point. Or I, I did such and such that wasn't right. And you don't feel shame and guilt, you feel godly sorrow. Well, what's the difference? Godly sorrow is optimistic and positive in that it prompts one to take pity on oneself as a fallen, broken person. Man, no one, I mean, there I am. I I am a pitiful being, and I'm really sorry that I'm fallen. And then you acknowledge your wrongdoing or character shortcomings, and you resolve with God's help to grow in this area. This draws you to God. It doesn't make you want to hide from Him. So godly sorrow is a recognition of of your pitiful state, what you've done, a recognition that that guilt and shame is no longer something I should feel emotionally because that was taken care of by my substitute, But what I should feel instead is a sense of sorrow uh, that I'm I'm not what I would like to be at this stage or sorrow for what what happened, which draws me toward, it's hopeful. It has a sense of recognition and taking pity on myself for the sad person I am. And I'm drawn toward God, not because I, I want him to hold me. I just need him to hold on to me for a little bit. And I, uh, and I want a hug from the Lord Jesus or, you know, whatever it might be in your case. So, the, so and this is amazing, um, by con- contrast, retaining subjective guilt and shame causes one to carry experiences of condemnation, you beat up on yourself, prideful self-sufficiency, and self-preoccupation. When you do something wrong and you feel shame and guilt, you think about it all the time. It occupies your mind, it run, and you, you can't break away from it and think about what you ought to be doing and getting on with your life because you carry this, and it's self-condemnatory feelings towards yourself, and they do you no good, and it, it takes you out for the, your, the purposes of God's plan for your life. It's just like uh, shooting your legs out from underneath you. And don't do that. We've got to learn to practice not doing that. When we start going towards shame and guilt, stop. Say, wait a minute, no, no. I actually believe, you say to yourself, Romans 8, 1 and Colossians 2. I actually believe that. So uh, my guilt and shame have already been experienced and taken care of. But I am sad. I just am sad. Because I'm, I'm such a broken person, and I'm so needy, and that makes me just want to run to Jesus. I don't need to clean myself up first. I'm just coming the way I am. And uh, I will talk about confession of sin later. So, so uh, it, this, this feelings of guilt and shame also foster habits of earning restoration with God by asking for his acceptance only after one has punished oneself enough to approach the mercy of God. So that's why we confess over and over and over again, because we don't feel forgiven yet. And we confess until we finally have that sense that I've been forgiven. And what's really going on under that is I'm beating myself up until I feel like I've flagellated myself enough to where I'm probably, it's okay for me to come in God's presence. And I don't mean, I mean, I've been guilty. That's sick. I'm, I'm sick like you're sick. I mean, so I'm not blaming you for being sick. I'm accusing all of us of being sick. But do you see what, how sick that is? And so if you're in the habit of constantly confessing, you're, you're carrying guilt and feelings of guilt and shame that you shouldn't be carrying. Instead, you ought to be focusing your attention on the sadness that you're experiencing about what you did. It just makes you sad or, or your lack of character growth. 
And that makes you want to run to God and to have him just love you for, for who you are in the midst before you even confess. Just that the way you are right there and let him love you. And it's restorative where guilt and feelings of guilt and shame are destructive. Godly sorrow is restorative. It brings me hope. It reconnects me with God rather than making me want to hide from him. All right. Now, having said that, um, we, we conclude then that, that, that godly sorrow and sadness are huge, but felt feelings of guilt and shame should not be a part of our lives because they've been dealt with at the cross. Doesn't mean we don't feel anything, but we don't feel that. We feel godly sorrow. Now, what about forgiveness? Well, let's talk about what it is and what it isn't. Forgiveness is not forgetting and reconciling. To forgive somebody doesn't mean you forget what happened, and it sure as heck doesn't mean you reconcile yourself with the individual. There are some people that if you try to reconcile, you're going to get hurt again because they're predators, and they have predatory personalities, and you need to stay away from people like that. I had a guy in my life that was like that, and he was eating into me and spreading gossip and lies about me, and I, the Dallas Willard knew this guy, and he knew me, and he said, stay away from him, J.P., Stay away from him. He's toxic, and when you're around him, he'll do nothing but attack you in a manipulative way. Just, just don't, don't be around him, and if you pass him in the hallway, you don't need to be mean-spirited, but treat him like a 7-Eleven man. You know, just do your business with him and, and move on. Don't get hooked into it. So what I'm trying to suggest is that it is not reconciling. That's different. Forgiving somebody is not... It's not forgetting and it's not reconciling. It's not letting somebody off the hook by trying to keep them from suffering the natural consequences of their acts or releasing them from the just punishment they deserve by the state. You can forgive someone personally but believe that they should be executed in capital punishment because they need to pay for, for what they did. And the state has an obligation to do that. That's not inconsistent. It doesn't mean that you, you give them approval or you excuse what they did or you justify it or pardon them, which means releasing them from the consequences of, of what the person did. People should experience the natural consequences of their actions. Those are instructive. Uh, it, 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 it doesn't mean refusing to take the wrong seriously and attempting to minimize or rationalize it. Well, you know, he had a tough day, and it was, you know, it's just a bad day for that, my friend, you know. Well, that's rationalizing their behavior. So now what is free of this? Be, be important to keep these notes and go back over these. I'm going a little quick, but I, I want to get this before you. It, to forgive someone is to have mercy for and to take pity on them as the basis of choosing not to make that person suffer for what he or she did. You release and abandon the person to God. We release our bitterness and our desire for revenge. It is canceling a debt owed to you, wiping the slate clean. Now, let's be clear about this. This doesn't mean that you do not believe that they should be punished for what they did uh, by the state. It means that you are not going to carry uh, anger or a grudge or be arguing with them in your mind or, or any of that. You're going to let go of them and release them to God to deal with them uh, as, as he sees fit. It doesn't mean that they should not uh, compensate for what they've done wrong in, in the relevant kind of way. What it does mean is that you don't need to make that happen for you to feel okay. So you're going to release them yourself from you needing to make sure that they're, they're punished or exposed. Um, so it's, that's what that number one means. It's not keeping a track record in your mind of what they did. Um, now... <clears throat> Remember I said forgiveness is not forgetting. I'm not, and it's hard to forget. So you can forgive without forgetting. 
But not keeping a track record means that you're not adding up in your mind, he did that to me, he did that, he did that, he did that. And you're keeping a score on how many times and how bad this person's been to you. That's different. When you do that, you're preoccupied with this person's wrongdoing toward you rather than getting on with your life. Now, my view is that we all need a small group of friends where we can process and complain about a person who has been, who has been uh, abusive to me and done things wrong to me. Uh, and because I need to get rid of those feelings. And in addition to God, it's helpful to process it with a small group of very close friends who will keep confidence. That keeps me from gossiping because I need to release this. But if I don't have a small group of people I can talk with, then I'll start, le I, I leak, we all leak. I'll start leaking over everybody, and pretty soon I will have spread this rep, uh, stuff about this person that is not my job to expose. So uh, when you process and you complain about it with a small group of friends, they can tell you it, that you're now get, getting to the point where you're now over the, over the line, and you're starting to really badmouth and gossip rather than just trying to get this off your chest so you can heal and, and release them. Do you understand the difference? So I believe in that, but I don't think you should keep a track record and add up score and all that stuff. It's not seeking to make the person afraid of me or intimidated by me, though appropriate self-protection may be necessary. You may need to stay away from the person or protect yourself from them. And there are people in this room dealing with those kind of situations with people that have hurt you and have a reputation for being toxic. And you're feeling like you need to meet with them or something. And my view is you don't cast pearl before swine. And what Jesus meant by that was you don't give something that is wonderful, like a pearl, to a being that can't digest it. So it basically means don't tell people the truth or good, or good things if they can't hear it. It does, it does no good and hardens their heart. That's why he taught in parables, to sneak the stuff by their defenses. Okay? But so, so don't, you don't need to do those sorts of things. Uh, uh, you don't want, want to feel like you've got to meet with them and t tell them again what they did wrong uh, if you don't think they're able to handle it. They, if it's just going to turn into an argument and reinforce their view that you're a loser and they're not going to receive it, why? T it's just pointless to tell them. You under am I, are you following me on that? Okay, all right. Um, now, uh, forgiveness uh, is, uh, forgiving in, for, means forgiving God for letting this happen to you. That may sound funny. Uh, it is a bit funny, but sometimes we carry a grudge against God for why did you let this happen to me? Sometimes we need to say, Lord, I want to release you. I, wanna, I, I want you to know that I don't hold a grudge against you anymore. And, and you, know, we're, you know, we're insane because God doesn't need to be forgiven, but we still feel like he's culpable. So what we need to do is to tell him, I've been thinking you're culpable, and, I, and why in the heck did you not jump in and help? And I, I want to, you know, I'm releasing you. My, I want to change my attitude on that. Okay. Now, it also involves cultivating a dispositional readiness to forgive. This means to be to, to do practices that help you become a forgiving sort of person. Now, let's look at how you do that. Here are some ways as to how you can become a forgiving kind of individual. The first is you've got to remember that God loves to forgive. He absolutely enjoys it. He loves doing it. This is not something he begrudges. He likes it. I mean, just think of your favorite activity. You know, going to Hawaii, a certain food, and you just love it. That's what God feels about forgiving people. He loves doing it. It's in his nature to take delight in it. Well, I mean, if he takes delight in forgiving me, oh my gosh, if I really, if I get a hold of that, then I'm going to learn to, to, to receive his forgiveness that he's given me, not grudging, he didn't do it grudgingly, mm, here you are again. Uh, uh, it, he takes delight in it, especially with his dear children. And so we want to learn to try to imitate God and practice being like him in that regard. To uh, learn to take pity on others 
and oneself is fundamental. This is achieved. How do I take, learn to take pity on other people or me? This is achieved by recognizing that it's broken, disastrous state of our shared humanity, asking yourself what you would like others to do to you, okay, and then do it to them. <laughs> um, treating others and yourself like you hope and envision a close friend or dear loved one would treat you. You hope that if you told a dear loved one something that you did wrong, they wouldn't beat the heck out of you. They, they would say, well, you need to make it right or something, but they would be loving and helpful and kind. You want to be that way. It is important to remember that God has forgiven me when I didn't deserve it, and I want to do the same to, uh, to uh, uh, want to do the same, others to do the same for me. D, picture the person as a little child being mistreated. This is so helpful. This guy that was attacking me, a colleague at, at the university, I tried to picture him as a little two-year-old or three-year-old in a home that was dysfunctional. I didn't know if it was or not. But I pictured him growing up and all the hardships that he must have had. And I began to actually feel pity for him because I imagined him as a baby or a young child uh, and, and, and things happening to him that, that, you know, kids tease him on the playground or what have you that would bring him to this point. And that kind of imaginary thinking helps you. And you may be wrong about the specifics, but we've all had those. And it's, it's an attempt to try to put yourself in, in their shoes when they were more tender and vulnerable in younger age and empathize with them. You might not be able to empathize with a person who's down the office from you because they're an adult, but maybe when they were like, four or five, it's easier to empathize, and that's what this helps you do. Um, picture the person, uh, picture Jesus holding your offender as a child close to, to his chest in a loving, protective embrace. Imagine what you would be like if you had grown up under the horrible circumstances that he or she grew up under. And then finally, do a benefits burdens analysis uh, on working through forgiveness versus holding on to forgiveness. Is it really worth it? Uh, usually it is not. Now, let, let me move on. And uh, I, I want to, there's something else that we'll talk about. But should we judge other people? Uh, can I just say, I'm so tired of Christians saying, well, it's, it's not me to judge. And that's baloney. It, it just, it, we're, we're supposed to judge. And so, please, I mean, be, be, not be nice to this old guy, you know. I'm getting crotchety in my old age, and the Chiefs lost today, and I'm in a bad mood. But, but look, would you, look, don't do this thing where we're not supposed to judge people. Be more thoughtful about it. Now, here's what, here's what Jesus taught. Don't judge that you should not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. Now, there he says, don't judge. But now he says, why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but you don't notice the log in your own eye? He doesn't say you shouldn't be looking at the speck in the other person's eye. He says you start with you, and then you move out. You know what I'm saying? Okay, you hypocrite, he says. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you'll be see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Well, that means you've got to judge that the brother has a speck in his eye. That's judging. So, Galatians, brothers and sisters, even if a person is caught in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual are to restore to such a person in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so you won't be tempted in the same thing that that person did. So here's how to reconcile all this. Judging is condemning or having contempt for or exalting myself over another person? No. We're not to judge people in, a, in, the, in the sense of elevating ourselves over them or in uh, having contempt or, con or condemning them as being worthless or anything like that. That's not our job. But judging is evaluating, assessing their behavior or discerning and admonishing them to repent from something. That is the kind of judging we are to be doing with society and with each other. 
That means that we need to be assessing our brothers and sisters. And if we find something that, that, that they need to correct, that, then we need to say, you gotta, you know, I'm sorry, but there's a spec here. And I'd love to help you if, uh, if I could um, work, work through that if I could be of help. You might want to start doing that with your closer Christian friends. But the, but the point is that we are to judge if we're going to evaluate ba bad things from good things. And we're to be constantly evaluating our, the people around us, our culture. So we don't do it to judge or condemn, but we do do it to assess so we can have an accurate assessment of certain things and, and not fuzzy assessments of it. Okay, in, in Roman numeral four here, I've just added another text for you to put on a three by five card if you want to. I won't read that to you. Um, but these texts might be helpful. Let me move on to Roman numeral seven. Then I want to summarize and make one point, and then we'll move to our uh, Q&A time. Roman numeral seven, addendum. I'm assuming now that Romans 8, 1 and Colossians 2 are true, that we really are... There's no condemnation any longer, that we're actually forgiven. All right, on that assumption, what are we to make of 1 John 1, 9? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and righteous so that he will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we're already forgiven by accepting the gospel, why should we confess our sins again as recommended by this verse? Our pardon was granted when we embraced the gospel. Acts of practicing 1 John 1, 9 do not re-grant a pardon we already have. Rather, like the regular celebration of the Lord's table, such acts are reminders of our need for the forgiveness God has given me. I remind myself of, of a need, what needy, broken person I am, and I experience the godly sorrow that comes from that. And I acknowledge that to God. God, I am, I am at such need of the, of the gospel uh, because I'm broken and I'm not what you want me to be. And I, I'm sorry. I'm sad about that. Okay. And they are occasions, doing 1 John 1, 9, of experiencing cleansing and release. So you're not asking for a, a brand new forgiveness. But what you are doing is it's an occasion where you are acknowledging that you did something wrong and you're broken and, and, and asking God to be pitiful to me in my human condition because I'm pitiful and, and need mercy. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on with godly sorrow. That's the difference. Now, I want to say one other, th one other thing that I, that I omitted. Forgiveness is both... A, a decision and a process, okay? And I forgot to mention this. You have to decide, at some point, if you're forgiving yourself or somebody else, you have to decide, and you say to yourself, I'm, I'm really hacked off at this person. And I don't want to, I mean, right now, I hope a lot of bad things happen to him, to be honest with you. And uh, the, the guy's a jerk, and he deserves everything he gets. Uh, and that's where I'm at, but... I, right now, with as much sincerity as I can muster, and which isn't a lot, but whatever, whatever sincerity I got, I want to forgive so-and-so for what he did to me. And be sure you read what that means and doesn't mean. And so then what happens is you have begun the race. There's a beginning to a race, and then there's the running of the race, right? You can't run the race without starting. Well, in forgiveness, there's a beginning to forgiveness, and there's a process of learning to grow in that forgiveness that may take six months to four years, depending on how much you're able to release that person. But you have to start somewhere. And so you start, even if you don't feel like starting and you feel like a hypocrite, and you just acknowledge it. Lord, I don't, uh, you know, anyway, but, but I'm going to ask you, Right now, to take whatever I, a sincerity I've got in my heart, and I'm going to let go. I'm going to forgive this person. I don't want to carry him around all the time. And I, you know, I will you begin a process of releasing. And a person will come to your mind, and you'll re-release them. And you'll let them go afresh. 
Does it make sense? So it's then a process of forgiving. It's not an instantaneous act. It's got a beginning, but then it's a process. There are times for exposing people and what they did, especially if what they did is hurting other people. But you have to be careful about doing that because sometimes exposing a person is, is, is casting pearl before swine in the sense that that person and those that are around them are so hardened about this person being wrong about anything that there, nobody will listen to you. And at that point, it's smarter to not get enmeshed in the situation because it's not going to do any good to expose them. I hope this has been helpful. Um, you're looking at me like I'm from Mars. <laughs> and uh, it's going to get worse during the Q&A, so thank you. <laughs> Take 10 seconds, stand up writing, don't go anywhere, just stand up, stretch your legs out, get that blood flowing before we jump into the Q&A, stretch it out. Wasn't that great? Are your minds and hearts exploding? Awesome. Go ahead and have a seat. Nice. Nice. We had a ton of questions coming in, and I was uh, trying to sort through them, trying to combine some of them, trying to find the themes that you were all <laughs> asking about. Whew, that's going to be tough to do. But uh, I figured we'd start with a softball question. Sure. Is that okay? Sure. All right. What is your favorite thing about Biola from Tori, a Biola student? Do you know who Tori is? Yeah, I do. <laughs> my, is Tori my favorite here? thing about Biola is that there is still a little bit more than 50 to 60 percent of the faculty and staff that believe the Bible and that are committed to the Great Commission and to the Word of God and to evangelism. Uh, maybe 70 percent. But we've got woke faculty that are com coming in and eroding the university. And, I, and we've got to find a way to get rid of them. And I don't know how to do it. I've gone to confront some of them that they ought to leave. Uh, some of them got so incensed when the Supreme Court passed a ruling about uh, not government, the government doesn't support abortion, that they're, they're all pro-choice, which we have a doctrinal statement they're supposed to sign to be pro-life, that some of them left. Wow. They couldn't believe the gall of the Republican Party or whatever they were saying. So there are problems at Biola, but look at me, okay? The Christian College Coalition is falling apart. Christian colleges are dangerous places to send your kids unless you check those schools out. Because there are, there are some schools that kids go there and they let their guard down because it's a Christian school. And they take in whatever, and it's poison, and they don't know it, and the parents don't know it, because the advertising says one thing, and what the faculty's like is different. Biola is not there. It's one of the schools that's, the, that's stayed true to the, to the faith more than any other school I know, but it's not perfect, and we've got erosion coming in, and we're doing stuff to stand against it. I don't think I haven't made some enemies, but... Uh, um, but what I do like about it is that we're still standing pretty firm. And at least there's a resistance movement against the encroachments of this stuff. And it's not going to come in our watch, at least for God help us. So I like that. I like the fact that Biola is still, uh, by and large, a faithful institution. The lesson is be careful where you send your kid to school. And especially if they major in the humanities. Oh, uh, please don't do that. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. All right, thank you. I love what you had to say when as you were distinguishing, um, as you were talking about guilt and shame. Yes. Um, I'm going to combine these two questions. Is guilt or shame ever good? And is there a healthy guilt that doesn't lead to unhealthy shame? 
Well, I don't think so. Uh, what is guilt? Guilt is a sense that I've done something wrong and I feel guilty about it because somehow or other I'm responsible and I, I, I don't know, I kind of need to do something about it. And I think that what that does is it denies the complete sufficiency of the cross. And I don't think that we believe Romans uh, 8, 1 and Colossians 2. I just don't think we believe them. And I'm saying that you, we need to get to where we actually believe them, and that's going to change our inner lives. What I do think we need to do is to feel what I try, I'm trying to distinguish as godly sorrow. Now, that's not nothing, folks. That's, that's when I've done something wrong. There's a sadness that comes in my heart. It's not a self-condemnation. Okay. That's one big difference. Because uh, guilt and shame, or I start self-condemning myself. I don't condemn myself. What I do is admit to God and to myself that I am pitiful. And I, and I have got a lot of work to do in my life. I, I got I to gotta get on it and grow in this area because that wasn't appropriate. And I may need to go to that person and ask them for forgiveness and reconciliation, whatever. So all of that is still in place. And I still event, come to God, but I don't, first of all, clean myself up by confessing and all that so I can get, come to him. I come to him in the midst of my bad stuff and say, I'm a mess. Do you, do you love me? <laughs> and then I move to confess and acknowledge later. So that would be my view. But, but, but having godly sorrow is not like, you know, you, you just get a free pass. I mean, it's a legitimate feeling of sadness for what I've done. It's acknowledgement that I just did something objectively wrong. And I am, I am going to be drawn to God by this. It's, but it's hopeful. It's more optimistic that God has taken care of that, but he wants me to grow from this. And I still have to, you know, ask for forgiveness or whatever Great. I may have to do. So, anyway, I could be wrong about it, but that's where I'm at. Well, this next question, I okay. think, dovetails nicely. They're asking it based on, John, on James 5.16. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. This is this saying it is necessary to confess your offense directly to the person against whom you have sinned or confess it generally to somewhere else someone else. Well, I I I think that it would generally mean confess your sins one to another like you would confess to a priest, but I don't, I, I don't believe that we need to confess to priests, but I do believe that what we do need to do is to acknowledge what we've done to our brothers and sisters and, and receive, oh, admonishment, or, or it's the one another's of scripture, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think confessing our sins to one another is really healing. And I mean, I've got some close friends in the, in the body where I can tell them stuff about me and they can get on me, but I, they've earned the right because they love me, and that's extremely healing. Now, if, if, if it's appropriate to go confess to a person that you've wronged, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. There are certain occasions, though, when it's not, it would be sharing with someone something that is not going to do any good. If the person is, you think is, would be willing to receive that, and they would still be hurt and, and angry and maybe upset with you, but they would be really willing to say, you know what, I'm really mad and I'm not over it yet, but I, I, I thank you for saying that. And I want you to know that I'm, I want to work toward forgiving you more and more. Now that's, that's but if the person just is, is got a vendetta and they're just closed to anything you're going to say to them, in fact, if you come up and confess your sins to them, they're going to start manipulating you and doing things that are manipulative, then that's, that's a pointless confession. Mm -hmm. It's casting pearls before. So it's giving somebody the truth, but they can't digest it. And it actually is counterproductive to that person because it's another step in hardening their hearts on the occasion of your confession. So we need to be wise about taking biblical texts and, and combining them with other texts 
and having a sane, holistic approach to these matters rather than proof texting, because uh, that can get us in trouble. That, that's, could, could we move off this subject? <laughs> oh. I wanted to get to some really thorny ones, but, but anyway, but go ahead. Be, if, they, if that's where people are at, that's fine. Could uh, confession be one of the ways or, uh, that you see godly sorrow in someone else? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, acknowledging, the, acknowledging that you've done something. Yeah, of course. Okay. And asking for their mercy. For sure. Yes. Next question. When the culture's narrative is based on living your own truth and love what or who you love, how do we counteract this? Act, how do we counteract this with winsomeness? Yeah. Um, well, you, you, you need to know ho, 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 how to defend your faith. Uh, and why you believe what you believe. And there's some pretty easy little books that you can read out there that are, are written at a level, at different levels. But you, you owe it to the Lord and to the church that at some point in your life, you're going to buy an introductory little textbook about defending the faith or about learning answers to people that people have against Christianity and some evidence for, for Christianity. And... Um, and that would be good for you. So what you can do is is you can <clears throat> you you can say to the person, well, you know, I I think my truth is good, or something like that. But you have your truth, or yeah, living your own truth. Yeah, love what or who you love. Yeah, well, try to find out something that they care about very deeply, and then treat it in light of their view. And, and the uh, absolutist will come out of the closet very quickly. So, for example, what I'm trying to say is nobody believes this. But that's the thing you've got to say in culture to be respected by culture. You've got to say this or your friends will shun you. And so it's a way to be safe. So I was, and I ever, I've, this happened years ago now, but I was at a 7-Eleven and, and I, it was a long line. And there was a guy in front of me and we knew we had a long wait. So we started talking and it turned to ethics and we're out moral issues and I don't know how it got there but um, he said yeah he said you know I think that whatever is true uh, for you is true for you and that's great but I have my own truth and it's true for me and you know we ought to live and let live and not judge other people's truths I said well you know I think I understand what you're saying and I said I don't know what you're going to think of this but I've got four friends and once a month, we, the five of us put uh, uh, money in a kitty. I think I said $50 in a kitty. And we buy a, gal, uh, uh, a drum of sulfuric acid, and we go out to Lake Paris. One guy's got a boat, and we, we go out, and we dump the acid in the lake, and we wait to see how many fish we've killed that's belly up to the top, and whoever has clo got the closest number of fish with kills wins the 250 minus the cost of the sulfuric acid. It is a blast. <laughs> because I found out that this guy was deeply committed to the environment. Oh, wow. And his blood vessels. So all of a sudden, he became an... Abs he, I, I said, you know, I'm not an expert on body language, but it looks to me like what you're, you're thinking of my friends and me is that we're doing something wrong. So it occurs to me, sir, that you're only a relativist in areas of your life that's convenient, like your sexual ethic. But when it comes to things that you know are right and that matter to you, you become an absolutist very quickly. And see, people are not consistent in, their, in, in this, you know, love anybody they want to kind of a thing. Well, could I, go, could I go shack up with your mom for three or four weeks when your dad's out of town? And I'm kind of into bondage stuff. I mean, with that, you know, that's my truth. That's my truth. Do you think? And I want to school your mom. I, she's not into that. That's okay. She'll learn. And I, you know that. There's, but you see, don't put your stuff on me, here. huh? Martin, yeah. Okay. Yeah, don't put your stuff on me. So what? I, I, you you come up with an example that you know the other person is going to think is wrong. Am I? Are you tracking? And then you say, well, you know, but based on your own principles, uh, then I, I think that uh, you should allow me to have the views that I do that you somehow get all huffy about. What's that about? 
So that's one thing to do. And the other thing to do is to say that that view that everybody has their own truth and we all ought to live with our own truth and love whomever we want is actually immoral. And here's why. It silences the protest of evil. Because if you're going to protest racism or you're going to protest child molestation or a number of other social evils, the first thing you've got to do is judge it's wrong. And that's the reason why you're protesting it. But if you think that you should be tolerant of them, meaning you're not allowed to say they're wrong because that's their truth, I'm only allowed to live by my truth, and they're free to live by theirs if they want to be racist, who am I to judge? Well, then, then I can't protest racism. Does that make sense to you? Because I'm, ha- I'm going to have to judge that, what, that that's wrong for everybody. And so that, any, any view that allows, disallows the protest of evil hmm. is a hideous moral doctrine. And, and loving anybody you want to, uh, again, they, they wouldn't want their parents to have been that way. Hmm. or whatever. So there are ways of, of trying to explain that. Right. Good. Sorry. Yeah. No, that's great. Sorry about going nope. in, in a way that was a little bit that's okay. out there. That's <laughs> okay. I forgive you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 High five on that one, dude. <laughs> that was so good. <laughs> okay. All right. So here's the next one. So I believe that the intention of every author of every book in the Bible was to write down the inerrant words of God as they were inspired by their experiences with God. But being that the authors of the Bible themselves were all fallen people like you and I, what are some of the best arguments that you've come across that help confirm for you that the authors have never, even accidentally, tainted the purity of God's inerrant inspiration with their own flawed thoughts and opinions while they were writing down the moral takeaways of their experiences? Yeah. Well, first of all, this is a great question. But your understanding of inerrancy is, is uh, which means that when properly interpreted, everything the Bible asserts to be true is true. It contains no affirmation of falsehood or error. That's, that's what inerrancy means. doesn't mean it doesn't use figures of speech when it says everybody in the whole town was at the door that's a figure of speech. If there were a couple of guys home watching a baseball game, I'm not going to get all my shorts bundled up on it. Uh, you know, so there, there are generalizations and stuff like that. But when interpreted with sane principles of ordinary interpretation we use every day when we talk to one another, uh, the Bible properly interpreted, whatever it says is true, is true. The, it's not the writers that were inspired. It was the writings that were inspired. And so you, you, the, Luke did not know he was under inspiration. He tells us in Luke 1, he did historical research and wrote. He just did his homework and wrote. But what the doctrine of inspiration says, all Scripture is inspired by God. And if you look at the way that some of these words are used, it's like, it's like the way the, the, that a boat on the water, the, the, this, this current uh, directs the rudder and it goes where the stream is going. And so God did not override human authors and their personalities to communicate his word, but he was able to do so in a way that protected them from affirming things that he did not want to be affirmed. And so the ultimate author of Scripture is God's spirit, but it is in and through the agency of human beings. And uh, that's not an incoherent notion at all, because a lot of times we will accomplish things intentionally by means of of some other agent. And the the only difference is that in this case, uh, God God protected their their own literary styles and writings so that they, they wrote from their own personalities, but within a boundary that the Spirit made sure was, was, was not affirming error or lies. Now, the best case for this uh, is, is the following. The, 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 the argument that I like 
uh, and I published on this, but um, you start with arguments for God's existence. And if you, you show that it's beyond reasonable doubt that there is a personal God, and there are e easy to understand arguments that God is real, and it's pretty easy to respond to the arguments that are against God's existence. Then you say, okay, well, which religion should I choose? And you, 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 for, there are ways to decide that. But one principle is, well, <clears throat> is there any religion that requires the supernatural activity of God to explain how it got off the ground? Now, you don't with Islam. Because Islam, in Islam, most of the Quran was written by Muhammad who said that he went into a cave and, 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 and it was revealed to him while he was in a cave. And I've asked Muslims, how in the world do I know the guy's not lying through his teeth? I mean, can, is, do you have any evidence that, that, that this actually happened? Well, yeah, the, 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 the beauty of the Arabic from a simple common man. And the truth is that, the, from what I've heard from Arabic scholars, is the Arabic is terrible in a lot of places. So, I mean, they have no evidence. But you look at us, and we have historical evidence that the New Testament documents are historically reliable, and you can get the case for Christ by Lee Strobel and read that. That'll help you. And, and if we assume that the New Testament documents, there are 27 of them, are reasonably reliable historical documents that were all written in the first century. We're not assuming they're inspired. They may have mistakes in them at this point. But we are assuming that, that, that Jesus, there's enough evidence to trust them to have given a reasonably accurate account of Jesus' life and some of his teachings. Maybe some of them were lost or made up, but most of his central teachings and and it is miracles. <clears throat> and so you can then show that Jesus actually was this incarnate Son of God who rose from the dead because the evidence for the resurrection and for the historicity of the New Testament documents is so strong that arguments against their general historical reliability are usually are, are usually so weak that it's because people start with the assumption that there's no God or miracles never happen, and that guides what they're allowed to find. Whereas I'm a person who starts with God's existence, and once I've got that on the table, then I say to myself, I have no idea if, if God did miracles or not. But he sure could if he wanted to. So what i got to do is go look and see. I don't have any preconditions about what he... I don't know the divine mind. I know there's a God. There has to be. The universe began to exist. It's fine-tuned for life and a bunch of stuff like that. But so I use historicity to decide that we that Jesus rose from the dead and was the Son of God. Are, are you with me? That, that's the second stage. And then I say, we also have a, an, a accurate enough texts to tell us the gist of what Jesus believed about some things that were really important to him. Hey, I, I'm going to give you the fact that maybe some of his teachings were fabricated by the church 40 years later. Okay, I'll give you that for the sake of argument. But the, the core teachings, these documents are too early. We can date them so that there wasn't enough time for legend to creep in, and they were actually preserved through Jewish, Jewish oral tradition which was highly, people were highly skilled in an oral culture to memorize and to retain the accuracy of things through two generations. And the New Testament materials were all written well within a two-generation period of time. And so what I'm going to say then is that we know what Jesus' view of the Bible was. Uh, as a matter of fact, he said that there's not a jot or a tittle in the Old Testament that won't be fulfilled until uh, that will be that will not be fulfilled before the end of the age. Now I, don't, I can't do this, but here is an R in Hebrew, and here is a D in Hebrew, and the difference is a little thing right here called a tittle. 
It's a little tiny thing that differentiates an R from a D. And a, and a dot is, uh, is, is what you might call the letter Y or Yod. It's just this little tiny thing that does like that. And what Jesus is saying is that even down to the words that were used to write the scriptures are going to be fulfilled. Why? Because they're all true. And there are other passages where Jesus affirms the truth of Scripture. Now, you might say, well, that only covers the Old Testament. But no, it doesn't because it covers anything that was Scripture. Now, at the time he said that, the only thing that fell under that group was the Old Testament. But if there was anything else that turned out to be scriptural, it would follow under it too. And it turns out that Jesus placed his imprimatur on 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 the apostles and some of their colleagues and their writings were considered to be scripture early, and uh, Jesus actually predicted that he would give them remembrance of some of the things he said. So I believe in inerrancy because I believe the historical evidence is sufficient for me to know Jesus rose from the dead, was the son of God, and what he thought about the Bible, namely that he thought it was the inerrant word of God. So I believe in the Bible's inerrancy because I believe in Jesus. I don't believe in Jesus because I believe the Bible's inerrant. Mm -hmm. But that's circular. The Bible's inerrant. Why? Because it says so. Why do you know? How do you know what it says is true? Because it's inerrant. Well, that's not a that's (laughs) that's a circular (laughs) argument. You don't want to do that. So that's my basic argument for it. Then it's fulfilled by then it's proved further by archaeological discoveries that have confirmed unbelievably, an unbelievable number of details. Uh, a lot of the problems people have is due to, to Western misinterpretations of ancient Near Eastern texts, and uh, so on. So that's enough on that. So there, um, obviously, this topic was going to stir up yeah, things it is. in people's hearts and minds, and we were, we were prepared for that. And I just want to, this one isn't necessarily a question, it's more of a statement, okay. but I wanted to give you an opportunity to speak, respond to it, respond to it, maybe speak some life, some encouraging sure. words to this person. Um, and there's several that... Okay, uh, let's go. Let's go with those. Dr. Moreland, since I became a Christian in 1969, after serving in the U.S. Marines, much guilt has followed me into mm. civilian life. The most hurtful has been with my siblings. I'm the oldest and black sheep of the family. None of them have called me or invited me to the dinner table or their home in 50 years. Um, um, This breaks my heart. And uh, Lord, right now, whoever this is, uh, we who are this dear person's brothers and sisters can't hear this without it breaking our hearts. Just feel so sad for this person, so sorry. And would you, would you please bring them a substitute, whoever this is, a substitute family with friends and, and people that he loves so that he can let them go. And I'm asking that you would restore to his life more friendships than family members that he lost. Amen. Amen. What I would say would be that... <clears throat> If you have tried to reconcile and ask the question, why, what, what have I done that has made me excluded from you, my siblings, interacting with me? I really would like to know if, because I would like to see if there's any way I can make it right. So do it humbly. If you've never done it, be humble about it. Don't get defensive and defend yourself. Be humble and, and, and send an email or, or send a letter. I'd, do, I'd rather do that and, rather than call because it gives them time to think about it. And, and if that gives you an opening, then you can start a conversation and maybe acknowledge that there's a role that you played, and then maybe you could find that there was a role that they played. So that, that would be a way to take steps towards reconciliation. If they live close to you, this might be a little bit of a stretch, but if they would be willing, one of your brothers or sisters would be willing to get into counseling together so that you, you could work toward increased connection, that they'd need to want to do that, but that would be something you could follow up with if you sent a letter and opened up 
and, and they took advantage to try to communicate with you and started that process. If you've tried that or if this doesn't work, <clears throat> then what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to cut your losses. And you're going to have to say, like many people in the history of the church have had to do, and, and that's, uh, you know, Jesus said that by comparison with, to, with, to your love with your family, if, if your, your love isn't, for me, greater than that, then, there's, there, then you, you've got confu a disordered set of loves. We need to love the Lord Jesus more than our families. It didn't mean we're not to love our families. It just means we love him more. And I would say to try to cultivate uh, find new ways to be draw in, become intimate with, with Jesus. There are, there are books that are not standard evangelical books, but they're, they're, there's some good literature on, on the inner life and how to draw close to Jesus. Dallas Willard's writings do a great job of this. So, so work on that. And then I would work, I would say to myself, how can I assess my friendship standing right now? Do I have any friends, and how close, or do I not? If you're having struggles with friends, then you, I would be working on that. What Get some counseling. Why am I unable to form friendship relationships? What am I doing wrong? And grow. Grow from that. If you're doing pretty well, I would begin to cultivate those friendships and build a new family in the church, in the body of Christ. And... and and that, over time, will become increasingly satisfying to you But if you give energy and time to that. That's about the only thing I can say to a really tough situation. It took courage for you to share that. Thank you. Yeah, I love the way you concluded that because there's someone else who asked, how do I move forward when I'm not forgiven by someone else after a genuine apology? And you answered that one at the end there. Thank you for that. This one is the opposite end. Um, opposite part of forgiveness. Not forgiving myself and others keeps the, fame, keeps the pain fresh so I won't do it again or be harmed the same way. How do I get past this? So, so not forgiving others and himself does what? Keeps the pain fresh. Yeah. Okay, yes. So I won't do it again or, oh. or be harmed the same way. How do I get past uh, okay. this? Okay, so, so if you've done something to someone else... You don't want to forgive yourself because it keeps the pain of the results of doing that thing fresh, and that's a deterrent to mm -hmm. doing it again. Your approach to life is not emphasizing the positive reasons why you want to move on. Instead, you're motivating yourself by negative reasons. It's like... If you can harm yourself and suffer, then maybe you won't do that again. But Jesus did, did not motivate people that way. He painted a picture of the possibility of what life could be like living in the kingdom of God with, a, with real fervency and earnestness. And he offered this positive invitation to begin the process of spiritual disciplines to enter more and more into that life. And it's possible to attain real growth in there. It really is. Where you get to the point where things that don't matter don't bother you anymore. You're not afraid of dying. Uh, you, you can learn to have joy and peace when, when life is falling apart. This is really possible. And I would say that, that you're punishing yourself through a negative type of motivation, and I don't think that's the way to do it. Instead, it would better to be approaching this as to how can I cultivate being the kind of person who is so filled with generosity toward other people and understanding and kindness that I would, could imagine myself doing that to them again. And that's the way I'd, I'd go, because the way you're going is, is like an addiction. You're sort of addicted to the pain, and it will work for a little while, but it's like Turkish delight. It, it'll run out, and you're going to need to inflict yourself with more pain to get the same deterrent buzz. And it's, lead, it's a cycle that you, will lead you down to enslavement, where your mind will always be preoccupied with, your, with this issue and you won't be able to get it off your mind. 
Now, the other one was uh, um, other people for, did something to me, and um, I, I want to keep the pain of that so, so I don't get it hap have it happen again. Not forgiving myself and others mm -hmm. keeps the pain fresh so I won't do it again or be harmed the same way. Okay. Well, look, there, there are other ways. First of all, I get the idea that if someone has hurt you and you have reason to think that it wasn't really 50-50 or maybe a little bit more your issue than the other person, you've always got to look. Remember, first look to yourself and then look to the other person. That, just that's a sane principle of healthy living. And so you got to first of all start by saying, I, I need to, to, to deal with what I can control. And, and that's me. <laughs> and so what, if anything, did I contribute? And how can I uh, make that right in some way that could be heard? Now, work on that. that that's where you start. Uh, the second thing, then, that you do is you assess whether that person is the sort of person who would be willing to hear uh, you come to them and express your, your sense of hurt as to what they did and, 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 and speak to them about it civilly and, 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 and say, could we, try, could we work this through? Because I found this really hurtful and painful and I, I would like to not have this tension between us and is there a way that we could kind of reach an agreement and apologize to one another, however that would end up? If, if you don't think that that would work, then I, I don't think there's anything wrong in staying away from dangerous people. Paul did it. You know, he said so-and-so, I forgot the guy's name, but he said he did me much harm, watch out for him. You know, don't get close to the guy. Well, there are people I avoid and, uh, because I, they're toxic and they just take the life out of me. And I got enough stuff taking the life out of me. Uh, you know, how about you? I mean, so I don't need a toxic people doing it. So I would say that you may be justified in staying away from them, but but don't let don't the, the pain. Remembering the pain is the wrong way to go about it. Um, you want to get rid of that sense of pain, and that doesn't mean you're going to lose your motivation. You'll remember what it was like, but you can move away from those people without having to torture yourself with the pain. That, that would be my basic answer to that. Thank you. Yeah. This one's a little lengthy one, but I think I thought mm -hmm. it would be... Uh... Feel free to leave whenever you need to. All right. Thank you. Oh, yeah, good to see you, ma'am. You ladies came. Yes, we did. You're <laughs> sweethearts, I'll tell you that. Give me a great hug. Oh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I was actually hitting on you, ma'am, but 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 uh, <laughs> but it, but somehow it didn't work. Uh, yeah, I know. Okay, I'll get that off. Just kidding. I was just kidding. <laughs> All right, go ahead. My wife just gave me the. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Manny. <laughs> How do you stand for God's kingdom in the broken world without holding non-Christians accountable, like we would hold other Christians accountable? For example, if you have someone in your life that is part of the LGBTQIA community and in a relationship with another member of that community, 1 Corinthians 5, 9 through 11 discusses that you are not to interact with, the immor with immoral Christians, but you should interact with immoral people who are of the world. Are you still being true to God's kingdom when you extend your friendship and to love them or attending their marriage, baby shower, etc.? Very, very difficult. <clears throat> And I think this is one that needs to be judged on a case-by-case -case basis. Because I think the rule of thumb would be that you, uh, you, 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 sh you show kindness. We're talking now about an individual. You show love and kindness to them, but make clear that I don't... This is, in my view of the world... This is, this is not right, and it's not conducive to human flourishing. And so I, I would see uh, sexual 
uh, heterosexual, homosexual activity uh, being like driving your car in the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, if my neighbors went every Saturday and took their cars and saw how far they could get in driving into the bottom of the Pacific Ocean, and whoever got the farthest win, you know, won the, the, the prize for that day, that might be fun for a little bit, but eventually it's going to ruin their cars because cars aren't made to, were not made to function that way. Hmm. They were made to be driven on, on smooth highways, not in sand, salt water and sand. And what kind of neighbor would I be? if I never said anything to them about what they're doing and, and warn them and said, you know, I got to tell you, I know what you're doing is fun, but if I, can I just say that I think in the long run, this is not going to be conducive to your well-being because you're going to hurt that car and you're going to be a lot of money getting a new one. And I hate to, you know, I know you've been trying to save up for some, some things and I just don't want you to go to see you hurt. Same thing with homosexuality. I was on a radio show. And I was, uh, they had a guy, it was a, a trap, because we were supposed to be talking about the, whether we're souls or brains. And, and the, these two guys, this guy, this scientist had uh, a biologist on there who I had signed a statement called the Nashville Statement, where I said that I think that traditional marriage is the only way of pro appropriate sexuality uh, in God's eyes. And, and this guy was married to, a, 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 was in a gay marriage, another man had children. What are you going to say to my kids? You, so they set me up, and he was there at, wow. to ask me a question, and I didn't have any time to get ready, but I was already ready for it. But, but he, he's, you know, he said, well, what are you going to tell my boys about their daddies? I mean, you, what are you going to say? And I basically told him, I'd say, I'd say, Timmy, you know, you've got, you're in a family here. And, but I have to tell you that in the long run, your, your daddies are, 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 are without meaning to. They're, they're going to really harm their lives. And they're not going to be the kind of people they could be if they led a chaste life. Because they're, at, they're functioning in the way they weren't made to work. And remember, Paul was against homosexual activity, not because the Bible taught against it. It's very important. He was against it because it was contrary to the way we were made. Look at Romans 1. It was contrary to our nature. And that means that it is available to all people everywhere without a Bible to know that this is not proper behavior because all people have access to the information needed to make the judgment that this is, this is, this is not virtuous and it's, it's viceful. So the point is that uh, it can be loving to tell someone like that that, that this, is not, this is wrong and here's why. Loving people isn't just always being accepting of what they're doing. If you have friends that love you and they've never told you something you needed to hear but didn't want to hear, I don't think they're friends. So you have to get to the point where you can earn the right to do that. And I would start by just being a basically just loving and accepting. But I would make clear about my views. And eventually, if, if I earned a connection, I would exp explain to them, this may be six months later or whatever it might be, that this is, this, th I've never told you why that I'm sad about your gay practice. And here it is, and I would go with the car in the bottom of the Pacific. Mm -hmm. You're not, I know that this isn't going to be in your best interest over the long haul because this isn't the way you were made to work. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm concerned about it. You're, you're going to hurt your own life, but you're getting a little Turkish delight now. Now, that, that, so, so you love and accept, I, I, and if they don't, you know, if they don't want to listen, then I think you just continue to... If they're your kids or, or, or close friends, you continue to love them and make clear who you are. Now, do you go to their wedding? Individual choice? I would be inclined to say yes, as long as you've made it clear that you're there because you love your daughter or whomever, but you're not there because you're supporting this act, but you're there to show love to her in spite of your disagreements. And in that case, I'd probably err on going, but I could see an argument for, for not doing it. But if you don't, 
then I, I would just urge you to express your, your, your discontent about this in a, in a way that's not harsh or consigning them to hell or anything like that. Because you don't go to hell because you're that way. You, you go to hell because you reject Jesus Christ. And there are some people who've never heard, and that's a whole other issue. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the way I'd go about it. But it's a tough issue, and there's plenty of room for disagreement among thoughtful Christians on this one. Sure. Thank you for that. Did you want to add something? Did you want to ask me something, Ray? Okay. All right. How you doing? How you doing? Okay. I'm, I'm having more fun. I'm worried about these people. All right. Well, it's, it's 7 Are you getting anything out of this? Yeah. You, no, no, I didn't mean that for... But okay, do you, you, 15 more minutes? 15 minutes. Let's yep. do it 15 All more right. minutes. All right. All right. Um, just to let you know, our kids' ministry is good to go till about 7.30, and depending on how Dr. Molin is feeling, um, he mentioned he might be able to host a, answer a few more questions after 7.30. But Quickly, the two books, one is on dealing with depression and anxiety, and the other is a book where I document 50 miracles that have happened today and I know about, and I show how to tell the difference between a coincidence and a miracle. And I, I, I show you that miracles are happening all over the country, and they're real. They're not just trumped up. It's really an encourager. Anyway, yeah. so there you go. Yeah. Go ahead. Great. I'm severely hurt by my best friend who killed himself, and I also have guilt with it. Is it possible to have to forgive God if I feel he has wronged me in the death of my best friend? Man, that's, a, that, that's good. That's good. Yeah. I, see, I, I don't want to approach it through a sense of obligation. Um, do I have to forgive God? That, that's not the way I would look at it, because that is more looking at it. Do I have a moral duty to, to forgive God? So here, here's what I would say. 28% of Israel's hymn book that they used in worship were contained complaints against God for not being faithful to his covenant, for never showing up when he's needed, uh, you know, for, for being asleep. Uh, I think one of the Psalms actually accuses God of being on the john. I mean, uh, and this is the hymn book. And what this shows us is that that lament psalms are a clear indication, and the, some of the prophets did the same thing, that complaints against God that you're actually feeling are, are legitimate to express, and that God is big enough to handle it. Because he knows you got it, but you're faking it, and you're suppressing it. So if you're not telling him what you're feeling... But you're coming and, and, and doing the you know, pink dotted Swiss and flowery thing. God says, could you wake up and have a real relationship with me? I know you're hacked off. And you're acting like you're not. And I'm not that way. I don't want to get the false self. I want the real you. And the real you is mad at me. So tell me about it. So you start and you express it. Now, you know that, that when you're accusing God of something, that you're insane. Okay, uh, so, so th these are moments of, of needed insanity because we all need to get it off our chest. But when you come to your senses, you realize God, God, is, God is not capable of doing something wrong. And so he is not at fault for this. This is something he let happen. And you know what? Maybe he let it happen because if my friend had lived... He might have done tremendous damage to himself and other people in the next five or ten years. And so maybe it was best for God not to cause him, but to allow this to happen for his well-being over the long run and other people's. I don't know, but I'm sure that God had a good reason that I might not know of for letting this happen. And I'm giving you an example of one. So then what that would tell me would be that I should, after I've expressed that I'm hacked off at God, then I need. I eventually come to my senses, and I and I realize, dude, God, God, God has never changed. He, he's He's good, 
and he's not bad. He's not a bad being. He's a good being. And you know what? By holding this against him, I'm, I'm, I'm shooting myself in the stinking foot. Because if I want to heal and, and to go work through this, I need to draw close to God and near to him. I've got a bad image of who he is right now, and I've got to learn to set that aside and, and grab, grab hold of what the real God who actually exists is like, and I'll run to him like crazy because I'm falling apart. So that's the way I'd go about it, rather than as an invitation to draw close to the person who's really the only ultimate one that can bring healing, rather than do I have to. Mm. I, I think that's not the best way to look at the deal. Thank you. That's great. I yeah. love that. I think this one's pretty... Uh appropriate for these times that we're in. How are Christians to judge others in this whole identity crisis? And they're referring to the changing of pronouns, changing gender. Is it expected they are to accept others and even sometimes live with them in college? How would you advise them to stand up for their Christian values and not be coerced into accepting behaviors like this? Well, see, there's a principle in, I was on a bioethics committee for eight years with a group of nursing homes. And there is a principle in medical ethics that says that no physician or healthcare provider nurse should be required to do something that is against his or her own values, okay? So if a nurse is, is against abortion, they should not be required to perform one. They, they have the right to recuse themselves and they can find another nurse to perform the abortion is, is an example. And that is, a, that is based on the principle of respecting persons as having intrinsic value and not as mere means to an end, that we all have inherent intrinsic and value. Now, the unbeliever doesn't have any basis for why they think that. They have no grounds for it. I've read their literature and it's ridiculous. And the smartest ones of them admit there's, ab it's a, it's, there's absolutely no basis for the claim that human beings have equal value because we're not equal in any way. So that's, re that's just a ridiculous thing. The only thing that can really ground it is if we're all made, if we're all the same in some way that, that has gravitas. And that is the image of God's spell, the only way to ground it. Even though some are smart and ugly, uh, dumb, good looking, and ugly, and all the rest, we differ in so many ways. We're all made in the image of God, and we're equal as such in that way. So the, the point is, then, that uh, um, this principle is a way of respecting the dignity of that person's mm. autonomy in choosing what things in their value system, and if they've got a crazy value system, like, you know, they, they think rape's fine, well, then th that doesn't count. But, but it's some kind of a reasonable value system. Now... What happens then is that what you're doing to me is you're requiring me to use pronouns that are contrary to my value system. Why should I be coerced to do that? Now, I'm telling you, you'll get fired. And there are people that have gotten fired that I know of because they refuse to use the relevant pronouns. And it is not... It is, it is dangerous not to go along with this in today's society. I mean literally dangerous. So you've got to count the cost. But I'm going to use the pronouns. I'm not going to use pronouns that other people ask me to use because I don't believe they have the moral right to ask me to violate my own deep-seated moral convictions any more than uh, asking a nurse to, who's pro-life to do an abortion. So I'm not going to go along with the pronouns. I'm not going to try to make a big deal out of it. I mean, I, just, I'd rather be left alone about this, frankly. But I'm, I'm going to say, uh, you know, if I, I'm going to call you, and I mean no offense by this, so if... But the problem is, today, with the postmodern society, the wrongness of an action has nothing to do with your intention. It has everything to do with the result. No kidding. So if you didn't intend to do something, but, but they, they experienced it as a racist slur, you're guilty of racism, even though you had no idea you were doing it and no intention. Because 
the history of postmodernism that began with the, Fr the French, can anything good come from France, um, it ended up being that a view of language that the, that the meaning of language does not reside in the author, but it resides in the impact it has in victimizing the hearer. There's only one exception to that, and that's their own writings, because they, they write books and expect you to understand the meaning of their intentions and what they write. And if, so it's just complete hypocrisy. So anyway, I'm jumping around. But uh, yeah, I, 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 you count the cost. If you decide to go along with it just to preserve the peace and you don't think this is a hill you want to die on, I understand that. I, I'm not going to, for me, I've just decided that I, have a, I don't agree with this whole movement. I think it's taking the culture in a really bad place. And I, don't, I think we're too we get too much in a hissy fit about people being offended. I'm reading a book now about what the Bible teaches on offense. And it says that we are not to be e people that are easily take offense. Offense is not something that we should be into. Um, because that's not weighty enough. If you're offended by something I said, well, go to see a therapist. Um, <laughs> be, be, uh, because, because, look... Uh, the, what really matters is the truth of what I said, not whether you like or dislike it. That's what matters, and you've got to deal with my claims. Now, I, I, I'm not talking about intending to harm. That's different, uh, but I'm talking about taking offense. And if people are going to take offense if I use he and she and that's all I'm willing to do, I'm, I really am sorry because I don't want to take offense, but I'm going to stick to the old view that that's not my intent and that I have a right to, to, to live consistent with my own Judeo-Christian value system, which, by the way, hadn't done a bad job for a long time in sustaining stability and culture. Thank you. Yeah. I think we got enough time for just one All more right. question. I just turned 40 and have had same-sex attraction for as long as I can remember. As this attraction does not feel like a choice, how can I change this if it is considered a sin in God's eyes? Uh, you, you need to go see a Christian therapist. Um, I'm, I'm not qualified to answer a question like that. Um, I, I do. Ray, you have something. Oh, your former student, Beckett Cook, would love to speak with that and love on them a little bit. Yeah, Beckett Cook, who is a student of mine, has a radio show or a podcast. You, uh, you, yes, I meant to say that. How, would you tell me how to, get, how to find it? Well, he here you go. Well, hello. Sure, sure. Um, Dr. Moreland's former student, Beckett Cook, has a YouTube show called Beckett Cook Show. And this he, is his story, and he, uh, he'll love on you. Yeah, he had same-sex attraction gospel. for the longest time, and he got unbelievably zapped. And I mean zapped by the Spirit when he went to a church, which he thought churches were crazy. And he had the mistake of going to one. And the, and the word would spoke to him, and then he, a guy laid hands on him to pray over him, and he just fell flat on the floor. And he never, he was instantly transformed. He never, at least he told me, he never had a, a gay attraction since then. But the point is that this guy, he's written a book on this, he's utterly credible, he's fair, and he's kind of the, a guy that just knows these things on both sides. Go, go to him. I thank you, Ray, very much. It's on YouTube. The Beckett thank Cook you. Show. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Well, well, go ahead. No, you go. All right. Well, we've come to the end of our time. And before you close, I want to remind you of the two books we have available out in the Welcome Center. They're both available for 15 bucks. Finding Quiet, My Story of Overcoming Anxiety and the Practices that Brought Me Peace. And then uh, the other one is A Simple Guide to Experiencing Miracles. Does God still, is he still involved in our lives? Does he still intervene miraculously? Is the supernatural still something that, that's yeah. happening? Amen. Two great books that are available in the foyer. After we're done here, I'm going to pray, and uh, there's going to be a team of folks available here in the front who would love to pray with you, hang out with you, answer any questions, point you to the one who has the answers. 
please come forward. We're available to minister to you. And if you need to leave, um, as you're leaving, as you exit, the pergola underneath has a little snack table with some goodies and oh my warm gosh. hot cider and whatnot. Oh my please gosh. hang out, linger. Don't just talk about the content, <laughs> all right? Use both sides of the table as you get your refreshments so the line can go quickly, all right? But join me in a word of prayer, and then we'll uh, dismiss. Father, we thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for what you've done in our hearts, in our minds, in our souls, Lord. We are full. Lord, you stirred us up. Lord, we ask now that you would give us the power to live out what it is that you're doing within us. Speak mm -hmm. to us. Yes, Continue yes. to teach us. We surrender ourselves, our minds to you. If we have questions, Lord, and things that are nagging, Lord, may we search those out. May we lean into those. Seek the answers and not just give up because it's hard. Lord, you are the one who possesses those answers, those answers can, that can provide meaning and peace and direction and truth and hope. Mm -hmm. And so we open ourselves to you. We ask these things in the matchless name of your son, Jesus, and all of God's people said, amen. Please, one more round of applause for Dr. Moreland. Love it. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you brother. It was great.